I said to him over the radio, oh no, Phil, you know what's going to happen next? I'm going to crash. It's going to be a disaster. It's your fault. Oh, God. Set off and not five minutes later, all he saw was a plume of black smoke and a, a, an air ambulance helicopter coming in to get me. Yeah, that was me being an idiot because the car's really fast and I'd crossed the finish line, but I kept my foot in just a couple of seconds too long. We're not getting the full story. Yes, electric vehicles have a part to play, of course they do, but I don't think it can be 100% electric for a very long time. But there's plenty of options that we never hear about. There's 1.6 billion cars currently on the road, all of which can run on synthetic fuels. Um, I've just bought my full-on midlife crisis car. Which is? 54 this year. I've always said, I have soft spot for Porsche because they work and you can it's just use it and abuse it, it's a car. Um, and I've always said Porsches have to be rear-wheel drive only and a coupe. So I bought a Turbo S Cabriolet <laughs> in black and I drive it with the hood down and my shades on and people actively laugh and point at the middle-aged man bringing my crisis out into the world. Well, thank you for being here with me. That's and, a pleasure. And um, I, I will say first, uh, welcome back to Toronto. Uh, you used to spend quite a bit of time in Canada filming um, various segments through the years. Get, yep. Do you have any anecdotes from your uh, time Numerous there? times we filmed in Canada. The first time was not long after brain injury. So I was still wondering, I don't know why I'm laughing. It's not remotely funny. <laughs> Actually, my wife preferred me. She has told me. She said I was lovely. I had a two-minute memory uh, for several weeks, and she said, you were the nicest you've ever been. <laughs> I don't know how to take that. Um, but I wasn't long recovered, and we decided to make a film on the old Top Gear <clears throat> where we would race to the magnetic North Pole. Um, <laughs> those two would go in a Toyota Hilux pickup, and I'd go on a dog sledge. Have you done any dog sledging? It doesn't work. It's no, it just doesn't. It's always the wrong kind of snow for the dogs. It's too dry, too cold, too... It's snow! Anyway, um, in order to prepare for it, first we had to ask the doctors, can I go and spend the best part of a month, please? Uh, we were leaving from Resolute Bay. Can I go and spend the best part of a month up there in the Arctic? And they said, we've never been asked by a recently recovered brain injury patient if they can do that. So, yeah, probably be <laughs> fine. Uh, and I started off by spending two weeks in a Iqaluit, um, right on the edge of the ice, um, learning how to, to run a dog sledge. And in fact, I was going to stay with um, Maddie, Matty, who was the um, female explorer. She's a phenomenal woman, incredible. And I knew she's a kind of polar queen. She's been to both poles numerous times, alone, leading expeditions. I was going to go and stay in her house. And I thought, this is going to be like some magnificent ice castle guarded by polar bears. It was just a very nice suburban bungalow. <laughs> it was exactly like the one my mother-in-law lived in. <laughs> but she was lovely. So, yeah, I spent a long time there. And then we set off from Resolute Bay um, to go off in search of the magnetic North Pole. It's proper cold. And? I didn't get there. No, the other two did in their car. Actually, we'd, the race was over. They'd got there and done it. Um, so we set up camp. We were, it was 24 hour sunlight, so we were rolling the clock. So doing sort of eight hours on, six hours off. <clears throat> we pitched the tent um, and the plane was going in to collect them. And the first thing you have to do is build a runway. Ah. So run up and down on the ice and put black things along the side for where it can land. Uh, and it came through on the radio that the plane in landing to pick up Jeremy and James had broken a ski, hmm. which meant it couldn't land to pick me up. And I cursed for two and a half hours straight. The rest of them timed me. So we had another 24 hours stuck on the ice in a tent, five of us. Um, fortunately, we had the expedition doctor with us who had his doctor's bag full of interesting things <laughs> that we were <worked> <laughs> I shouldn't say that, should I? But we did. We just entertained ourselves best we could for 24 hours on the ice. And the other, a, a, a favourite, favourite one filming in Canada, British Columbia, Wolf Mountain. We made a film. You'll have seen these Breitling watches, great big things where you unscrew the crown and pull it out. And supposedly a helicopter comes to rescue you. But if you've bought one of those watches, you're not going to do that 
because if you don't need rescuing, they'll charge you uh, thousands of dollars <laughs> for the trip. So we thought, we'll find out if it works. So long story short, they dropped me on the top of Wolf Mountain, um, set the alarm off, and then the guys had come and rescued me. And obviously, they really took their time. But for the film to work, I had to be, you know, really cross. But the fact of the matter is, I'd pitched my tent, I'd built myself a little bivouac round a tree. My wife had given me a bottle of her homemade slow gin. It went dark at half two. The crew couldn't do any more filming, so they all went off on um, snowmobiles down the hill to a big tent and left me on my own with my little fire by my tree, my bottle of gin and a book. I'd have stayed there for months. I'd still, <laughs> I'd still be there. I could, I've never been happier. But on camera, I had to be really, really angry, which was a lie. I was having a lovely time. <laughs> <laughs> I was. I'd still, honestly, well, nobody to bother you. Cruel disappeared, half two, bye, leave me on my mountain. I right. was perfectly happy. Gin in hand. Brilliant. What a life. Yeah, wonderful. Um, you're in a room full of folks who have passion for vehicles. Good. You have plenty of car guy credentials. You grew up in Sully Hall, which is very much the Detroit of England. You said this the other day <laughs> on the meeting. Yeah, Sully Hall and Detroit, they're, they're virtually indistinguishable. Um, <laughs> But you're, yeah. you're a mechanic, yeah. you, are, uh, you, you seem to like cars and the people who are around them. Is it too much to suggest that you were actually made for Top Gear? <laughs> um, it was always my passion. I mean, yeah, the car industry is in my blood. My grandfather was a coach builder. He apprenticed as a cabinet maker, went into the car industry, so naturally he was building the wooden frames. Um, so he was very familiar with ash. Worked he, working at Mulliners in Birmingham. That's not the one that made all the posh Bentleys and things. They're the ones who made all those terrible triumphs and things. But nevertheless, car industry was in the family. It was, I always wanted to do it. Um, drifted into broadcasting, having come out of art college, and I went straight into radio. That's how good a painter I was. <laughs> and, yeah. And, and after working in radio for, I don't know, five, six years, all I wanted to do was car shows. Cars were, that was it. I'd spent everything I had on cars and motorcycles, which wasn't a lot, but it had all gone. Um, and I was, I'd run out of money to the point where I went to the supermarket, big store, in the village where I was living with my cards to pay for my shopping for that week. And my, my overdraft was full, I couldn't borrow any more money. My credit card was full. That was it. I, well, and now I starve. So I had to go back to my little rented apartment and I kept my motorcycle, a GSXR 750. Does anybody know bikes? Okay, so GSXR 750, lovely bike. I got it on a loan and I kept it in the shed behind the pub opposite. <laughs> so I walked in, opened the shed door and then my, my bike it had like double headlamps and it was hiding in a corner at the back like that. No, not me, please. So I had to ride the bike to the town where I'd bought it and hawk it around all the dealers in whichever would give me the most cash. Took the cash and then walked home. It was raining, I was really glad because I was wearing all my butch bike gear but crying like a six-year-old girl all the way home. Um, so I realised I'm not going to make it in radio, I'm going to starve to death. So I actually got a job, applied for and got a job at Renner UK in the press office working for a legend, motor industry legend called Tim Jackson. Met a few people already today who knew him. He was one of the nicest men in the industry globally. But I, I got the job with a view to meeting the editors and the people in charge of all the car shows. And it worked. After 18 months, I, I went back into TV, finally doing car shows. So yeah, it's, it's, it only took me 36 years. <laughs> so well, how appropriate to have you back the here then. Yeah, absolutely right. right. Um, yeah, we've always, we've always had great fun filming here and the key thing you say about the car part of it the shows that I did with the other two idiots <laughs> well they're not here are they <laughs> um, <clears throat> the, we always used to say you don't have to be a car nerd to watch the show because it had a massive audience beyond car guys but you don't have to be a car nerd to watch it because we do that for you it was absolutely at the heart of everything we did our passion for cars, whether or not we were doing, you know, if, if I'm sitting on top of Wolf Mountain waiting to be rescued by the other two who are pretending to be really late and I'm pretending to be cross, it doesn't matter. Everything was still informed and driven by our passion for cars. What's the influence of Top Gear as you look back on it now? Uh, I'm, look, I'm looking for a good influence. Good influence on who? How do you mean? What influenced it? Or, or, or the influence on society? 
Car um, culture. On car culture, I think it perhaps broadened it. It brought more people into it. Um, but make no bones, when we started it, all we wanted to do was make the best car show we could. I remember the first conversations with the BBC, Auntie Beeb as we call her, uh, in the offices in London, way back in 2000, when we were just getting it in shape, ready to launch it. And I remember a very serious meeting when me, Jeremy, James, Andy Wilman, and the production crew, we all sat around and we said, right, the rules of new Top Gear. It's real world, okay, so no supercars. Uh, and then we said, keep it for real journeys, real people do. No travel to foreign places. <laughs> we didn't stick by those rules. We fairly quickly realized that cars, cars matter to us all because anything that you need beyond the comfort of your cave. We only need so many things, don't we? Shelter, then food, warmth, company, a mate, supplies. Everything beyond shelter, beyond your cave, you need to go out and get. So... Humanity was always going to invent a machine that enabled you to go and get it more quickly. And if it enables you to get it before the bloke or woman in the cave next door, it's even better. So it's the most important thing we've ever created. So we quickly realised, hang on, you don't have to be a car nerd to be touched by that. Cars move us physically and therefore they move us emotionally. So whether or not we define ourselves as car enthusiasts, we all have an enthusiasm, a passion for a machine that moves us in order to conduct our lives. They've shaped our world. Describe the evolution of that show. How did it, how did it transform? Well, a big fat man interviewed me and I got the job. Um, it, we'd all done, we were all long-term motoring journalists. We'd written about cars and broadcast about cars for years. Um, Top Gear had been rested, mm. uh, and then it was brought back by us guys. And honestly, there was no science in it. We're not clever enough to work out, hey, if we do this, it'll be really big in Australia. And if we do that, it'll be big in America and Canada and Russia. We didn't know. We just did the best show we could. But we were beneficiaries of the times. Yeah. People wanted... Um, it was a genuine show. It was authentic. It was never disingenuous. Um, but it was irreverent, uh, and people wanted that. We were just, just lucky, just did it at the right time, right place. Sorry, no science to it. We didn't know what the hell we were doing. It was scary, too, at times. Uh, a couple of dates that I'm sure are um, stamped in your brain. September 20th, 2006. <laughs> no, forgotten, oddly enough. Yes. Um, <laughs> well, you probably didn't forget going 463 kilometers an hour or 288 miles no, an hour. That was 320 and, miles an hour, actually. They always print 288. It was 320 miles The record's been set straight. It would have in been. In the vampire. It, it would have been a British land speed record if I'd gone the other way, but I didn't. Um, yeah, that came about because I went into the office once and just said to Andy Wilman, the boss, hey, Andy, I, I just want to go real fucking fast. That's it. And so he, we set about looking for an opportunity to do that. And in fact, I'd already booked in an appointment with my insurers to go and get new life insurance, which required a face-to-face -face meeting because of my job. Um, and Andy Wilman, the boss, said, no, mate, sorry, you can't go on that day. I need you to drive this vampire. Just so I crashed it with no insurance. <laughs> um, but yeah, it was... Um, a jet-powered car. It was a jet-powered dragster... Um, and it was the final run of the day. I'd been driving it all day. They'd blanked off the speedometer, so I didn't know how fast I was going because they didn't want me chasing speeds because that's when things go wrong. Uh, and we'd actually wrapped, finished for the day. But the director said, um, Rich, I've got permission for one more run. Carry on. So I did it. And on that final run, obviously gave it everything. Um, and it is that, because it's a jet engine. Right tire blew, right? The right front tire delaminated and blew at 320. It slewed to the right. Um, when I came to in the hospital, weeks later, really, the thing that most mattered was, had I done the right thing? And telemetry said, yes, I had. I'd pulled the chute, but the chute hadn't stopped it, and by then the car twisted, and then it was going upside down. And you turned into it, didn't you? Yeah, turned onto the yep. right. Right. It went off across the field, and then it started to roll, and I was still doing just shy of 300, um, and there was no roof. So I just thought, oh, that's that. Coming genuinely. And it wasn't scary. It was genuinely... It was no more than... I guess, sorry, this is morbid. We'll talk about funny stuff in a minute. 
I'll joke about how fat Jeremy is or something. But in, because <laughs> he is. But in the meantime, um, yeah, it's, we all kind of wonder, don't we, sometimes? Yeah. How's it going to be? When's it going to be? And to me in that moment, I thought, oh, it's now. Nothing more than that. Next thing to do on my job list was die. Um, but I didn't. And the next one, the, the one that the really... Rim, the RIMAC. The, that really <laughs> yeah. got people excited. Yeah. Uh, June 10th mm. of 17, right? Yeah, that was, we'd been, we're on a Swiss hill climb event, uh, and I'd taken the RIMAC Concept 1. Matei, who you met today, what yeah. a genius. Um, and he'd only, there were only eight in the world. And by the time I'd finished, oh, there were only seven. <laughs> <laughs> my, my favorite so, moment of this is that the only thing that you remembered was sky ground, sky ground, sky ground, sky ground. <laughs> yeah, it was. Well, I mean, I'd, we'd been doing runs up the hill all day, and weirdly, same, this is terrible, same director as the vampire crash oh. came over the radio. James and I were on our way back down the hill after our final run of the day. He came over the radio, lads, um, I've got permission for one more run. And I Again. said, this is really evil. I said to him over the radio, oh, no, Phil, you know what's going to happen next. I'm going to crash. It's going to be a disaster. It's your fault. Oh, God. Set off and not five minutes later, all he saw was a plume of black smoke and a, a, an air ambulance helicopter coming in to get me. Yeah, that was me being an idiot because the car's really fast and I'd crossed the finish line, but I kept my foot in just a couple of seconds too long and there was a left at the top with a bit of sand on it. Um, and the car rotated, and I went off backwards. And it end over ended multiple times. I think it, it fell about 500 feet, end over end over end, went between a tree and a house. I posted it with absolute precision. <laughs> <clears throat> uh, it was upside down in the air for quite a long time. I was thinking snacks might come round or something, because it was, <laughs> then I realized I'm gonna have to land, and eventually it did, upside down. I was wearing a seatbelt, not a full harness and a helmet, but no neck brace. Um, but I was okay dangling from the seatbelt. I knew my legs broken and my ribs. And I thought, yeah, I better get out. Started struggling to get out. And then I thought, no, somebody will come and get me. I mean, they will have noticed that. Um, and then I heard the fire start and I thought, oh, I really should get out. And I mean, all credit to Mate and the Rimac, the door opened after what the car had been through was incredible. I pulled myself out and a couple of people arrived and I said, don't pull me by my legs. They broke and pulled me by my arms, and they did. Um, and then they put me on the stretcher waiting to get into the air ambulance. And I thought, I'm going to have to telephone my wife. This is going to be a tricky telephone call. <laughs> but I thought it's going to come out on social media. So I said, I need a telephone. And uh, eventually, one of the medics gave me a telephone, and I rang her. Hi, Mind. Hi, how are you doing? Yeah, yeah, fine, fine. Car blazing away over there. Ambulance, <laughs> helicopter there. Yeah, yeah, fine. Look, um, I've had a bit of a shunt. You're probably going to see it on social media soon, but don't worry, I've run checks, and I had. I'd, in, I'd gone through saying to them, must have thought, the medics must have thought I was mad, because I was saying, right, I'm Richard Hammond, the date, this is the car I'm driving, my daughter's are Izzy, Izzy and Willow, my wife's Mindy, yep, everything works, my brain's okay. So I said, I've run checks, there's nothing that won't mend, legs and ribs and things, but it'll all fix. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and she was, she was all right about it. She wasn't pleased. Um, I thought she told you, you do this again and... Three strikes and I'm out. Right. But I got... Which she might have been out anyway at three <clears throat> yeah. strikes. Well, I got shipped off to the hospital, um, pumped full of morphine and a big cage around this leg. Uh, Swiss hospital. And they're quite good at mending broken things in Switzerland. Because <laughs> everyone breaks some skiing. Uh, James May arrived in the hospital with a bottle of gin. I couldn't have been happier. I was having a great time. The, the director, meanwhile, was practically having a nervous breakdown. Poor Phil, genuinely, it really hurt him. Because of what I'd said before the run, I still feel bad about that. But yeah, Mindy came out eventually. She was cross, slightly crosser when she saw the unbelievably pretty Swiss nurse that had been looking after me. <laughs> and I'd insisted on, oh, I want to have it mended in Switzerland because they're really good. And I've since had a tattoo. I had it finished on Monday on this knee. Um, it's now my Swiss Army knee. Remember the Swiss Army <laughs> pen knives? And it's got the little Swiss Army symbol on it? Because yeah. it's got all metal in it. Yeah. I know. It was just my parking. It's not my driving. I tend to park upside down and on fire. <laughs> <clears throat> Funny story. But my driving's I, fine. I asked Richard whether I could bring that story up in front of this crowd. And he said, 
You said what? Go ahead. Well, you might as well. It's always there anyway. I mean, people do. Well, every time you get into a taxi, somebody every asks you about it. Every single time, yeah. Well, of course they do. Aren't you the guy that it's, It was rather public. Yeah. yeah. It was rather public, yeah. Yeah. Oops. Well, you could have, you know, taken Remac down with you. Yeah, I could. I could but yes, I did. Well, the, I did destroy their, one of their eight cars. Right. So I'm, I think I should be employed as their test driver. <laughs> I'm going to put it to Mate Remac tomorrow. When you think about um, delivering automotive passion to the masses, which is what Top Gear effectively did, and it's what you're continuing to do, besides you, who does it well these days? Um, I think there was a bit of a slump, certainly from the UK, because they tried to just emulate what we were doing, because Top Gear came to an end. Jeremy, if you heard, didn't punch a producer. I was there. But he was out of order. He threw a strop, and they didn't renew his contract. I just want to get that straight, because you know, I wouldn't work with somebody who went around slugging colleagues. I wouldn't mind slugging him sometimes, but... <laughs> I'd have to stand on a box, and that's undignified. <laughs> um, so after we moved on to the Grand Tour on Amazon, they had various attempts. The problem was that they kept trying to just mirror what we did, but that show had grown up around us. It's like your favourite coat only fits you because it's evolved to fit you. That show did. Um, I think it's important that people do, because there's no doubt about it. Um, two key things in my life undergoing massive change in all our lives actually. Firstly the car, hello, we're all in the industry and we can see it's undergoing huge change. Also broadcasting, linear broadcasters are falling left, right and centre, it's all fracturing and changing. There's never been a more exciting time to talk about cars, nor a more important time because every single person buying their next car is the biggest purchase next to your house and it's the most significant buying decision you'll make in terms of your contribution to the future of, of the world. And I don't think we're not getting the full story. Yes, electric vehicles have a part to play. Of course they do. But I don't think it can be 100% electric for a very long time. But there's plenty of options that we never hear about. There's 1.6 billion cars currently on the road, all of which can run on synthetic fuels. Uh, the German government recently pushed Europe into saying, oh, OK, you can carry on making internal combustion engines until 2035, but only if they can run on synthetic fuel. That's every car in production and every car ever made without any changes to the current infrastructure. It can be distributed in the same tankers, the same gas stations, and used in the same cars without any modification and has to be if we're going to achieve net zero. I saw a I was at a meeting with Martin, the very charismatic and unnecessarily young CEO of P1, one of the companies making fully synthetic fossil free fuel. And he showed me a graph that said by 2050, by far, even if we could keep up the current take up of electric, which we can't realistically because China withholding rare earth minerals and also the problems of electricity generation and distribution and also price, um, even if we could, by 2050, by far, the majority of cars on the road will still be internal combustion engine. So we have to have synthetic fuel if we're going to achieve net zero. We have to make do and mend to an extent. We have to keep some of the car fleet working in order to collectively achieve net zero. We will do it. Engineering will solve it. I hate to say it, capitalism will solve it. We will solve it. That's not to say we can afford to be lazy nor complacent, and neither should we. It's very important that we don't. We cannot take our foot off the gas. But we will do it. Are you passionate about the coming wave of electric transportation? Yeah. Um, or, or, or does propulsion have little to do with passion? I think what the car does and can do for us will always be exciting. We'll never lose our passion for it. It symbolizes something essentially human and important. And I'm not overstating it just for you on that. I firmly believe that. Um, I think there's something desperately appealing about an internal combustion engine because it works in a way that we can recognize there's a chemical reaction leading to energy. Um, that's not to say I don't think people can be passionate about EVs. I think they can and will be. I think what companies like Rimac are doing, his, his isn't about a utilitarian alternative. It's saying this is exciting in and of itself, can be and shall be, and they will form part of the future. And the message I'm sure that we're not, the media is guilty of not putting across to us as consumers, all of us, is wait a minute, the future isn't a bleak, 
utilitarian landscape full of autonomous, anonymous boxes that you order from your smartphone. There will be those, and if you just go into the shops or to work, maybe that's the right application. But we're never going to lose our passion for these machines that move us physically and thereby move us emotionally because of what they do for us. I think, in fact, and I'm seeing it happen already in terms of media and at car shows, more and more people, when faced with the prospect of that sort of polarization into utilitarian purely, and that's part of what we must, you know, the necessary decarbonization of the transport infrastructure, there's a bag of syllables, um, that will form part of it, but also that's going to throw into contrast the other side of it. Wait a minute, I have an emotional connection with this machine that facilitates my life. My 20-year-old daughter has no interest in cars, but when we were talking about it, she said, but I really like my old VW Polo. Oh, hang on, am I a car enthusiast? Yeah, I think more and more people will actually find themselves declaring themselves as car enthusiasts because they feel an emotional attachment engagement for this machine that can do this for them. So I think the future is actually far brighter than it's being painted. Yeah, true enough. What do you say to people who complain that today's generation doesn't care about cars? Um, I, don't, I don't believe that, and I don't think it stands up. I think it's different. Of course it is, but so is music. Have you heard the crap they listen to? Good crap. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, young, what are they, really? Um, so it's going to be expressed differently, of course it is. As soon as my, my eldest daughter is, as soon as she passed her driving test, 17, which is the age you can in the UK, she just took off. And the car initially for her symbolised freedom. It wasn't about the car, it was about what she could do with it and where she could go. Actually, she's now discovering a latent passion for the machine that facilitates all of those things, which I think more and more people will do. I think it'll be different, of course it will. I, I've just discovered in the UK, for instance, the kind of car modding your own car. I thought that died out with my generation. I'm 54, and I thought we were the last generation to sort of cover your car in glue and drive it through an, an auto shop and stick bits to it. But actually, it's massive and blossoming and booming. Social media is sharing vast amounts of content on it. People are spending fortunes modifying their precious rights. So it's still there. It's just different. The problem is if those running the industry, supplying them, lose contact with what they're doing and what they want, we're left with this bleak landscape or the idea of one. But it isn't that. There's still a passion for it, and there always will be. Don't worry. We'll probably all still be in business 10 years from now. <laughs> probably. <laughs> Let's talk about your own collection. You've had some interesting rides through the years. I know one you want back, but uh, do you still have the 29 Model A Ford? Do you know, I don't. I, I did some trialing in it. Um, I love that car. It's another, I've regretted every car I've ever sold. Um, I did some off-road trialing in it and I loved it. I love the, I love that straight four. Just, it's a simple lump. It's also an early example of mass production. You can tell how it was engineered into it from the start. Um, so, no, I don't have it. I do have it? other vintage cars. Oh, well, let's talk about your other vintage cars. What do Old you have? stuff. Currently in the garage, I'm, I'm campaigning in the Exmoor trial with my daughter next week in a 1930 Austin 7. Um, Ulster bodied. I've got a 1934 supercharged Lagonda low chassis Tourer with the throttle pedal in the middle and the brake on the right. <laughs> and I let James May drive it <laughs> once. Because obviously in a panic situation, you just hit the thing that makes everything worse. <laughs> so I, I had a, a plaque engraved that sits on the dash. The brake is on the right. <laughs> you need to know that. Um, I've got a 1933 Riley Alpine Tourer. That's a lovely rare little car, little tiny straight six. So I love vintage stuff right up to modern day. You, yeah. you also have modern day stuff, right? Is, yeah. is it true that you have a Ram TRX? I had that for a while. Yeah. Um, I've just bought my full on midlife crisis car. Which is? 54 this year. I've always said, I have a soft spot for Porsche because they work and you can it's just use it and abuse it. It's a car. Um, and I've always said Porsches have to be rear wheel drive only and a coupe. So I bought a Turbo S Cabriolet <laughs> in black and I drive it with the hood down and my shades on and people actively laugh and point at the middle-aged man bringing my crisis out into the world. But you see, my, my reckoning is the car makes me really happy. It makes you happy laughing at me. 
so it's bringing joy. Win-win. That's a good, I think it should be state subsidized. <laughs> I'm bringing joy. Yeah, I'm, I make a lot of people smile every day in that car. You, you really regretted selling the Ferrari 550 Marinello. Don't right? talk about it. Yep, that's enough of that. Thank you. Yes, I did. Why'd you sell it? Um, I sold it because we live out in the countryside in the middle of nowhere as a family and I spent my life on the M4 commuting to and from London and I thought this is crazy family we need to move closer to London. We were renting a house at the time where we were out in the country so I rented a house closer to London um, and over the course of the weekend I moved my wife, two daughters, six dogs, seven horses, quite a lot of cars and motorcycles down to this rented house on the Friday. And by the Sunday, the removals guys were coming to offload the last truck. And I looked at my wife and my daughters and I watched them trying to fit into a, a sort of London life. And I just thought, that's not us, that's not them. So I said to the removals guys as they took the last things off the truck, put it all back on mm. and take us home. And we went back out to the country. But as a result, I had to rent that house for another six months. I didn't have the money. So I had to sell a Ferrari to pay for the rent. Oh, wow. Why'd you make me recall that <laughs> pain? Reliving it. It's PTSD. I loved that car. Garage space and budget, no object. Mm -hmm. It what? is an object, by the way. But let's assume it's not today. Can I what? have it from you that it isn't now an object? <laughs> Can you just call my wife and have a word? <laughs> What's the one car that you have to have? And why is that? Um... What sort of dream, a unicorn to chase down? Yeah. Uh, soft spot for the Lamborghini Miura SV. Blower Bentley. Um, Aston's, I'm DB4 GT. Okay. It would be a lovely thing. Um, modern stuff, I think McLaren are doing some great stuff. I could go on. It's just, you said no object, I can keep going. What's the one car that you probably shouldn't get behind the wheel of again? <laughs> um, it's more the context for me. Um, I, I just I get carried away. I get the red mist, and then I, I run out of mechanical grip, and then it's upside down and on fire. Again. <laughs> the worst bit is phoning my wife, though. It really is, <laughs> darling. You're gonna shout, but <laughs> yeah. Tell us a little bit about the other things that you're that you're doing. You're you're very involved in a production company. Yeah, I'm very lucky. I mean, I've done content worked, creation. Yeah, yeah, worked in the media for oh god, 36 years now. Started in '88, um, and I'm fascinated by the business. Um, so, I run an independent production company that makes my TV shows. I also now own and operate Drive Tribe, which is a digital marketing agency, content creation and distribution, which I'm absolutely loving. Um, just like the auto industry, the media industry is undergoing a massive sea change. It's democratized content production, which is tremendous. It's ruinous to a lot of the big channels and a lot of the big independents. Also, I run a, a classic car restoration workshop, which came about because there's a lovely local guy who'd restored my cars for years, running out of a little workshop locally in the country. And I, was, I used to go for Fish and Chip Friday. Are you familiar with Fish and Chips? Fabulous British dish quality catering <laughs> yeah um, I used to collect it on a Friday and take it over for lunch and we'd sit there and we'd eat and they were restoring a Jaguar E-type of mine at the time uh, and he was a bit miserable I said what's up so I'm losing the workshop well, they're developing it and I can't afford to get into another one I said, well that's a tragedy um, I need you to continue working on my cars uh, and then I said but you know I'm I'm not Jay Leno, I can't afford to employ you. Um, and there'd be no dignity in that for you, just working for somebody off the telly. So why don't, I'll bankroll us into another workshop. If you spend half the time working on customer cars and half the time on mine, that'll balance out. That would have been a good idea. Then I thought, that might make a nice TV show. And my independent production company got it commissioned, which meant the workshop grew, so it's now quite big. But I'm loving it. I'm loving, after 30 odd years of commenting on the industry and being around the industry. I'm now in it. Um, and it's slowly ruining me. <laughs> yep. It's the best money removal device I've ever, ever come up with. It just gets rid of it. It's brilliant. If you wake up in the morning and you think, I've got just a few dollars too many, set up a classic car restoration business and you won't have. 
nothing. Put your, your media hat on again, not, not your restoration mm. hat. Has the ultimate automotive culture show been created? No. Or does it still wait for production? Oh, God, it will happen. Of course, it will. It'll change. I mean, right now, we need TV shows and content globally that's telling us all as consumers what we're buying and why. I still talk to people in pubs they've never heard of synthetic fuel. Right. It's like, well, no, we can make this stuff. But the fact that, yes, it's inefficient. But to be honest, it's inefficient compared with using the electricity in a battery. But by the time you've distributed the electricity and made the car to use it, as opposed to banking hydrogen from excess uh, production of renewable energy and combining it with carbon dioxide captured from the ethanol industry, which is being emitted anyway, just takes a detour through your car. There's no fossil fuel in it, but people don't know. People don't understand the hybrids that are being developed that can, again, run on synthetic fuel, then you're getting really clever. But as consumers, they're not hearing about it. They get the sort of binary, polarised, state-sanctioned version of it rather than a fully colourful picture of what their options are, and that's important. Somebody needs to do that. It won't have two fat men and a little short one falling over with their trousers on fire. <laughs> it, it, it'll actually be quite an important thing, but we do need to know about it. The industry we work in is important at the moment. And as consumers, they're our biggest contribution. Yeah. We'll go back to the two bigger guys and the shorter guy for a second. When you think two about... Two older guys. Uh, no, sorry, older guy. guys. Sorry. Yeah. But what, <laughs> what, were, what were some of your proudest moments? What, what comes to mind when I say what you achieved on the show during the, the when run? I, when I contemplate our 23 years together, I can't claim to be entirely suffused with pride um, because we were just messing about. There were some oh, incredible moments going on stage in front of 52,000 people in the Polish National Stadium in Warsaw um, when our shows were dubbed into Russian, Chinese, Korean, mm. um, doing our live stage shows, yeah. Some incredible moments, but also some, we were the first Western film crew in the Shan State in Burma. Um, and there'd been three warring factions, warring for years. And we were the first Western cameras to go in. Um, <laughs> so we were filming a show there. So as ambassadors, not just for our nation, but for the whole of the West, we three freaks were chosen. And all three villages had come together for a celebration of us being there. And there were guys, they were all hanging around with AKs. They were all armed to the teeth and quite drunk. It got quite alarming. But just before it got <laughs> alarming, they were singing celebratory songs. They'd put like a rush mat out on the sand floor in the center of this very basic village with very basic huts, no power. Um, and they would get up and sing traditional songs. And they indicated that we three should do that. And we thought, well, we are ambassadors, we should. What song do we all know the words to? And the only song we all knew the words to. I don't, is anybody here a fan? You're probably not old enough. Frank Zappa? Of course, yeah. Do you know the song Bobby Brown? Is anybody familiar with the lyrics? I'm not going to sing it. <laughs> that was my next question. It's shockingly bad. The lyrics are horrible. And um, we agreed we'd do it. And I remember standing, waiting to go, go on. It was just a rush mat. And all the villagers were there. And I said, lads, are we really going to do this? Yeah, we are. And we walked out and we stood at the front of this big crowd and we started the, started the song. And I saw the lead cameraman, who was our age, and knew the song just like this. Look up. <laughs> and we sang it. So it's an unusual moment of which to be proud, but it was <laughs> the circumstances that had to have come about for us three to be the first Western film crew in the Shan State in Burma, bringing together three warring factions and marking the moment by singing a simply filthy song from the 1970s was, I figure, epic. <laughs> so we were proud. Yeah. It won't be remembered after I'm gone. <laughs> Last year on this stage, I talked to uh, Johnny Herbert, and we, yeah. we talked about the influence of Drive to Survive. The new season comes out, I think, this week or next week. Yeah. Uh, what's the impact, um, again, from an automotive, cultural, passion perspective of Drive to Survive? And maybe it's 
resonance with a greater audience? I think it's huge, and it's huge because actually all motorsport, it's, it's about people, it's a human story. All, all things automotive are, we're a people industry. Just as architecture is, these are machines that facilitate people's lives. In terms of motor racing, it's about the show, the spectacle, the drama, the human stories. Ultimately, I mean, if, if, if we generate enough income for the race teams in watching it, they can go out and compete to see whether the orange car is faster than the silver one if they really want. Um, but the deal is they have to entertain us, and it's made that clear. My 23-year-old daughter, Izzy, absolutely hooked on the whole drive to survive experience. It's, it's genius. Um, because she's realised, yeah, this, this is human. It's about people. It's about relationships. There's the gladiatorial element of the drivers themselves out risking their everything to do it. There's the financial, the business. So, yeah, I think it's really important. I think it's pulled in a lot of people. Are you surprised at the residents in North America? I mean, certainly Montreal has been a favourite spot on the calendar for drivers for a long time. Um, but, but now it's really with what's happened with Las Vegas and now Miami is going to go into its third year and mm. uh, there's talk of expansion into other cities. Well, I think motor racing is a universal language, isn't it? I mean, yeah. I've seen that in evidence all over the world, wherever we've been. If we've improvised a dust, dust track in a desert for a day just to go and mess about in the cars we're filming, people will come out. I've been to places where they improvise their own tracks. They, they, they may have very little money, but it all ties back to the first thing we did when we invented the car. Hey, this is great. Yeah, mine's faster than yours. That was it. Immediately, day one. <laughs> of course we did, That's it's true. human nature. That's true. Because what the machine does is enable us to go out and interact with the world and get stuff we need, experiences, friends, whatever. And if yours lets you get there first, well, it's better than his, isn't it? So that's why, we, that's why we've always raced. We always will. Yeah. You must get requests all the time from, let's say, social media influencers or celebrities who want your car or want to drive cars that you've driven or be a, be a part of what you're doing. What do you tell them? Um, well, we do work with them through Drive Tribe. I love it that because Drive Tribe as a digital platform isn't hung on my presence at all. It's, it's, it's a brand in and of its own right. So we're very happy to welcome those guys in. I'm always happy to talk to content makers. Absolutely, spreading the passion. Yeah. yeah, so we engage with them regularly. We quite enjoy it. I don't lend them my cars, I'll spoil them. <laughs> I do, I do. We have a couple minutes left. Give, give me a one word answer or a few words. No. Answer. <laughs> well, you would. Anything else was risky. <laughs> it was way too quick. We, we didn't even script that. Uh, a one word or a few words answer to the following words that I give you. Uh, this is, okay. You've, you've worked this out. I haven't. Could be anything. <laughs> That's the beauty of it. I might storm off. It's, li it's live TV. Okay, Ready? Go. Ferrari. Uh, hats. They sell a lot of hats. <laughs> <laughs> they do, they sell a lot of hats because they've got Ferrari on them. You say merch too, could be the this other word. This is like therapy, I'm on the couch. Yes, you are. You okay. can lay down if you want. Yeah. I could land myself in trouble with answers to this. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Lamborghini. Uh, oh, actually, Ferrari and Lamborghini. Oh, no, I won't be rude for <laughs> Lamborghini charging bull. Oh, bull running Pamplona which I did do. Mm. Don't do that. Bad idea. What happened there? Uh, I got slightly grazed by a bull. It's, it's, that does happen on the bull run. But Whereabouts? Um, across my back. Ah. Because a much bigger man than me, as the bulls are coming down the street, saw them coming and literally picked me up and put me there. <laughs> <laughs> I don't blame him. I mean, if, I'd been, if, if it had been the other way around, I'd have done the same. I like Lamborghini. There's a sense of humour. It still suffuses their product. They're still providing entertainment. Yeah. I remember working in Ripon in North Yorkshire and a black Countach came through and it just, just those glinting planes and angles. It's, it was a Countach, which, as we all know, is well, terrible. But what a legendary thing. Um, so, yeah, I think they still have that sense of humour and fun. Lara. Bloody long lived. Superb, actually. A massive admiration. And a Lada, it's the Neva, isn't it? The off-road, before, before. Yeah, that's Not right. the Reva and Neva. Right, yeah. um, superb. I love a practical car. Um, and I love cars that were born out of necessity. And they were engineered to last. Koenigsegg. Uh, really, really difficult to spell. I mean, nearly impossible. <laughs> Think, could, could anybody here spell it? Unless, does anybody deal in them? In which case, that's cheating. Um, <laughs> 
Yeah, again, tremendously exciting. I love, I love the pantomime and theatre of hypercars. That's just yeah. great. Long must happen because anybody buying them is buying them as much for us because, I mean, you don't want to be... It's a hell of a burden, but somebody else can have it and you get to watch it go past. That's a win. Yeah. Spiker. Spiker. Oh, wow. The interior of those things is just crazy. The Dutch... Quite an old brand, actually. Yeah. Um, Victor Mueller's baby. But you, you say, why do you build those? Yes, I have no idea. <laughs> Smoking a pancake. Um, <laughs> crazy interiors. I love them. And I love that craft aspect of it. And they're fabulous things. De Tomaso. De Tomaso, which one? Pantera? You, oh, you tell me. Oh, it's a combination of uh, Italian and big American V8. I've nearly bought a De Tomaso Pantera so many times. I would still love one. <coughs> fabulous things. Again, sense of fun. Tesla. Uh, an astonishing uh, feat of commercialism. Um, I mean, incredible to watch how it happens. And I think necessary to, to really make electric vehicles possible as part of the overall picture. But I keep coming back to this. It's going to be a mosaic. It's not a purely utilitarian, dull future where we all somehow have to suppress our passion for these incredible machines. We don't. We'll still be able to celebrate it. OK, you might well order on your smartphone something to take it to the shops, but on your drive will be something you love and that isn't hurting the atmosphere and ruining the planet, but that you adore. It might be something that has a sense of history. The carbon footprint of my 68 Mustang is however many years old that is, 55 years old. Um, so I don't have to remake it. And if I can run it on fossil free fuel, well, hey, it's as green as any Tesla. But it's played its part in bringing it to the fore. Right. Vinfast. Ooh, Vinfast, you're going to have to talk to me a bit more about Vinfast. It's Vietnamese startup. Yeah. yeah. Electric uh, I, entering the North American market. I now. love. When did we last live through a time of startups? As a journalist, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, Every year it was, wow, they've brought out a new seat colour. And, oh, you get electric, electric windows in the back as well as the front now. There was nothing to say half the time. But yeah. now there's whole new marks spring up and, well, Remac. Pagani, Remac. Pagani. Remac. Well, again, um, he'd been very clever. And I think the car industry was ready because don't forget a lot of that initial early R&D was working with a lot of manufacturers because yep. they saw the benefit in what he did so that's almost the whole industry acting as one that facilitated Mate with his genius to advance engineering to the way that he did so that's that's actually a really good sign that's the industry working as a whole there's still competition everybody wants to kill everybody else of course it's capitalism they have to final question focuses on dehydration why does it focus on dehydration? Something about peeing sand and stream. Oh, yeah. Well, that's because we'd been filming in Mauritania, uh, where it's very, very hot and very, very dry. And Jeremy and I had neglected. I mean, we're a big film crew now. There's a hundred of us when we're on the last couple that we've shot. Um, and we're pretty experienced and pretty good at hydrating. But you couldn't hydrate quickly enough. You'd be standing there drinking water in front of me now, and I'd be watching it steam out the top of your head <laughs> as it went in. So, yeah, uh, we were peeing gravel and hot sand. Oh, wasn't good. <laughs> it's a glamorous life that we lead. <laughs> Thank you for doing this. Thank you for being so entertaining and being so Well, thanks for listening so to honest. me ramble on. It's very nice to see you all. Richard Hammond. Welcome back to Canada. Thank you very much. Thank yes, you. It's been a pleasure having you. I don't get abandoned on a mountain this time, but you, now you know I won't mind if I am. I'd be very Hold happy. the watch. Yep, exactly right. It right. does work. Excellent. Very Thank nice you so to see much. You. Have a lovely show. Nice Thank to you. See you.